This KJZZ podcast series is supported by AARP Arizona, keeping Phoenix in motion with events to get out and do more things with your friends and family. Discover all the real possibilities here in the community on Facebook at AARP Arizona or aarp.org slash phoenix. This is The Recovering Caregiver. I'm Kathy Ritchie. I spent several years taking care of my own mom who had frontotemporal degeneration, a lesser known type of dementia. Her disease could manifest in the most excruciating ways. Behaviors like apathy, making inappropriate comments, or loss of inhibition are some of the hallmarks of FTD. So is loss of language. My mother eventually lost everything. She was no longer in control of herself. Her gray matter was being attacked and there was nothing I could do. Then, eight years after she started to change, she fell out of bed. That was the beginning of the end for her. It would be another two long, painful years before she died. There was a funeral, friends and family came to say goodbye, then nothing. Everyone went back to their lives, and I was left to figure out mine. This is Life After Dementia, and I am a recovering caregiver. In this episode, we talk about ambiguous loss, a term coined by author and grief expert, Dr. Pauline Boss. I first heard about ambiguous loss three years after my own mother died from FTD. And it describes a, a complicated type of grief where in the case of family caregivers uh, of loved ones with dementia, for example, their loved one is physically present but psychologically absent to them. So it describes a situation where losses can occur over many, many years, and they are compounded. It's the most complex form of loss, of grief. That's Ann Wheat. She's the executive director of Duet, a nonprofit organization in Phoenix. I don't think Ann will mind my saying so, but she's a super fan of Dr. Pauline Boss, and for good reason. Her work on ambiguous loss resonates with a lot of caregivers, including Ann. But more on that in a bit. In 2016, Duet partnered with Dr. Boss to take her book, Loving Someone Who Has Dementia, and turn it into a video and training for caregivers who might not have access to a support group. Don Cook appeared in those videos. I met Don a few months before his wife, Trudy, passed away from Alzheimer's disease. Don is one of those, it is what it is, life is suffering, if you're going through hell, keep going kind of guys. That doesn't mean he was disconnected from his experience. Rather, he was fully in the moment, present and engaged. But to exist in that space, one has to sit in the ambiguity, sometimes for years. And by the time her end arrived, she was basically a hollow shell of what she used to be. I loved the memories that being with her would bring, but there wasn't a whole lot of interaction anymore. I would go to see her and I would hold her hand and sometimes she would squeeze my fingers and that was about the extent of our communication. Yeah, I remember that with my mother because oftentimes I felt guilty because I would just be sitting there and there's nothing really to do. And it's it's very complicated because I think there's that idea that you should be sitting there holding them, holding their hand, brushing their hair and really it's so painful to see them as they are in that state. I hear caregivers say all the time uh, toward the end of these prolonged, very difficult journeys, I don't want my loved one to end. I don't want them to end. I want it to end. I remember thinking that same thing. I wanted it to end. But if it went away, so would she. Dr. Boss talks about both and thinking. She writes, when someone is both here and gone, the way to lower your stress is with both and thinking. That is, understanding that two contradictory ideas can both be true. This is the reality of dementia. And because I didn't have the language to describe what was happening to me, to us, I got stuck in my own guilt and anger and grief for what was probably years. I don't remember a time when I wasn't grieving, (laughs) 
But, you know, once my wife passed away, if people would see me and think, yeah, he's not mourning, he's not grieving, he's not crying, you know, shedding tears and debilitated and doubled over in the corner, those people have not seen the fact that I have been grieving for years. It's like someone, my analogy is, someone who's never seen the movie A Christmas Carol and comes in on the last scene where Scrooge is bringing the turkey to to dinner and going to pay for Tiny Tim's uh, doctor. And they think, well, Scrooge was a kindly old grandfatherly type because they haven't seen what went on before. People have not realized how long I have been grieving. And so they don't, I'm not grieving the way they expect me to, but I have been grieving in a very real sense all along. Complicated stuff, right? The other piece of this is the feeling experienced by many caregivers right after their loved one passes. A moment ago, you were talking about being relieved or whatever when they passed away. How do, do you feel release? You know, they are, you're glad that their suffering is over. What you don't really think about so much is you're also glad that your suffering is over, that going on this journey has been uh, uh, taxing, trying, uh, and and all of a sudden a huge burden's lifted off your shoulders so you feel a certain amount of release and oft times you feel guilty about feeling good about the fact that that all of that is over and done with let's talk about that a little bit i mean we're supposed to feel grief many of us feel relief i i think grief is part of everybody's loss journey everyone nobody escapes grieving if it's for somebody that you really cared about. It's just that in the case of caring for somebody with dementia over years, if not sometimes decades, that grieving has gone on and on and on. It's been our constant companion. We may not always notice it, but it's there. I likened it to acid dripping on a stone, drip, drip. Trip. It was always, always there in the background, and sometimes it just can hit in waves. Uh, uh, we have a, a fellow caregiver uh, in the support group who says, puts it this way, grief waits patiently. It'll always come and get you at some point. You may try to avoid it. You may try to get around it but, it, but it's there. And I think it becomes a part of us. That's not to say we stew in our loss forever. Though, in talking to caregivers who have lost their person, they, for the most part, fall into one of two camps when it comes to what to do next. Keep in mind, many caregivers, including myself, devoted hours to our loved one. That's a lot of time to fill. So, back to what I was saying about those two camps, there are those who say they don't want to look back. And there are those like Dawn. I cannot unsee what I have seen. I cannot unlearn what I have learned. And I think it is valuable for people in these support groups to have people who are com- all across the spectrum. You know, the, the new people coming in need to see, uh, ha- have some perspective about where the journey is taking them. And it's even valuable to have us graduates, as somebody put it, uh, <laughs> in the group to let them know that life goes on and there are um, there are still benefits and it's not only that but not just the group I am continuing to be I am still a caregiver even though I'm not caring for my wife Uh, I am I've signed up for this mentor program where there I have a couple of mentees who are caregivers that uh, I touch base with on a relatively regular basis to uh, give them help or somebody to talk to when they need it. And I am currently socializing with the widow of a friend of mine who has been, she has been diagnosed recently with Alzheimer's. Okay, let's pause. This is not what you think. But before we keep going, I think it's important to say that this is Dawn's process. On its face, it seems riddled with ambiguity. But as Dawn explains, it actually makes perfect sense. So... I am an ideal date for her because I know where this is going, (laughs) you know. (laughs) Uh, Wow. Yeah, well, and... Go there, go there. Tell me about that. Well, 
and it's 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 social. It's not romantic. We both agree on that. But uh, so when she tells me for the sixth time while we're out having coffee about something that happened or or some entertainer that she likes or a movie that she saw, I can act like it's the first time I've heard it because I've been down this road before. I know where this is coming from. I know where this is going. My wife's children are totally on board with this. Her children are totally on board with this. Her psychiatrist is totally on board with our going out together. We've known each other for 50 years. Uh, her husband was my best friend in high school, and we were roommates in college when he met her. Uh, her children and Trudy's children used to play together when they were in grade school. I mean, this is, this is such a good thing in that her children are totally comfortable because they know their mother is safe. I will protect her, and I will, I've will. i got some idea of what's coming. It's good for all of us, both of us, to get out and socialize. We, we are each other's plus one. This is tough. I mean, even though things have come a long way since my mother first became sick and there's more support and there's more organizations around it, I still hear people who are just not able to connect the dots. And that is really uh, problematic when it comes to caregiving and finding the right place and facility for them or finding the right care, figuring out how the system works. And the system's super confusing. (laughs) The system is confusing. And Um, I can say there are efforts, uh, a lot of efforts now going on for Maricopa County of how we can, those those nonprofit agencies, really work together at a more strategic, deeper uh, level to uh, make it, to simplify it for caregivers. Honestly, it could be a full-time job just to try to figure out how to get the resources that you need. Uh, It's overwhelming, and you're already overwhelmed trying to care for this person who needs help with almost all their activities of daily living living sometimes. So help does make a huge difference. Getting connected, getting out of isolation, we are not meant to be isolated. We know that that is a leading cause of death for people in the United States. So getting out of isolation, getting connected to resources and others, fellow travelers, I think, are vital And that's probably one of the toughest things to do, especially if you don't have support to help you with your loved one, you're working, or you have a family to raise. But for me, finding that support and talking about what was happening helped me process and deal with my grief. And after she died, I still talked about her and what had happened a lot. Then one day, it was time. Time to step away. I would say that that is a a healthy sign. Um, when somebody can transition away, I think that means if it's if it's decided by them that they are going through the the grieving and f- finding a way back to life after caregiving, um, I think that is a healthy thing. And when that time comes to move away from an event that consumed so much energy and took up so much space and step into something else, something other than this, you discover that there is room for hope in moving beyond life as a caregiver. Not that you ever forget it. I agree completely with Don that that, that, that is always part of our DNA after that experience and can be in, in very good ways. I don't think we see the world the same again. I don't think we, I think we are the people who notice suffering in the world. We're the ones who can then reach out and be aware, have that awareness and that sensitivity and empathy to help others. But also, though, to be able to get back to where you can define yourself, reconnect to those things that brought you joy and meaning and purpose. For more about life after caregiving, including my conversation with two young recovering caregivers, download more episodes at podcast.kjzz.org or on iTunes. I'm Kathy Ritchie, and thanks for listening to this episode of The Recovering Caregiver.